Um, I'm going to talk today about a thing called the autopilot pattern, um, but I'm going to start with a, with a story. Explain what, what it is and then try and run through some examples of how we're using it at, at Simwood in our containerization projects. So the story. In 1903, Wilbur and Orville Wright took flight. It was the first powered manned flight in history. They'd been at it since 1899, quietly, unassuming, nobody had really heard of them. By contrast, there was a very well-funded, funded by the War Department, character called Samuel Pierpoint Langley, who has been followed around the country by the, by the press corps, very interested in what he was trying to, trying to achieve. Now, he was approaching things in a different way to the Wright, the Wright brothers. He was trying to fly with raw power. He thought the fact his plane wouldn't stay in the air was because his engine wasn't big enough. He just needed more power to keep it up there. The Wright brothers understood the subtlety and what we now know today that the characteristics of a plane need to change to stay in the air. You need to fly the thing. A man has remained obsessed with this idea of uh, flight and in particular autonomous flight since then. That thing looks like a plane, um, but it was actually the world's first cruise missile in uh, 1917, a thing called the Kettering Bug. And it had no controls other than the engineer could point it in an appropriate direction for the wind conditions and calibrate the, the rotation of the, the engines. So it could fly 75 miles to a target and detonate on impact and obviously, obviously not come back. But it took, it was sort of around about the 50s that autonomous flight was going through its, its heyday or peak, peak of development. And there was so much that needed to develop in parallel to get to where we are today. And there's just some examples on that slide. But it was 1994 when we got what we now consider today to be the first UAV, the Predator drone. But even in 1994, when it was used in Yugoslavia, it was only used in a reconnaissance capacity. And the guys that were flying it had to sit in a van at the end of the runway where it, where it took off. Um, it was in the 2000s when it was used in Afghanistan that it got to the stage where it could be armed and it could be flown remotely from, from the other side of the world. So it took 91 years to get to where we are today from when the Wright brothers first took flight all those years ago. And I wonder what would have happened if Wilbur had said to Orville, what orchestration shall we use? Well, they got bogged down in decisions that were superfluous to their primary mission of just getting something off the ground and being able to fly. Two things would have happened in my estimation. The first possibility, they'd have been paralyzed. At best, it would have taken them longer to get where they, they got to because they'd have been confused and delayed by all these other, these other decisions that they needed to make. The second option is they made the wrong choice and they got locked into a technology that the passage of time rendered redundant or they had to go back and, and re-engineer. Thankfully, they just flew the fricking thing and we're where we are today as a, as a result of that. And I think that parallels quite well with where we are with, with containerization um, because containerization has assumed the responsibility for delivering on our vision of DevOps Nirvana. Every, every um, ideal that you get from DevOps perfection is going to be delivered by containerization. And that makes it a massive undertaking for your developer that's previous or your, your ops guy that's previously managing a few VMs or a few bare metal machines that wants to play with containerization and wants to try and move in that direction. There's a whole, there's a whole raft of decisions that, um, that he needs to, or she needs to make. Now, back at Simwood, when we started on this journey, um, we were slightly blown away, frankly, by the, the amount of choices that we need to make. The, fir the first one, I talked about at length last year. Who saw my talk last year that's here? 
Mark, so yeah, okay, about a third, third of you or so. So okay, so I'll give a quick recap on that. So the, the first choice was um, around the network driver. And this was a really big one for us because we operate and understand um, a network and we're fairly sensitive to it in the world of, world of RTC. And if you look at Docker or your typical cloud solutions, you have that freaking thing there, um, the Docker bridge, which contains all of the bad words that you'll read about on the mailing list, such as NAT and things like that. Um, so we wanted to get rid of that. And we did that two, two ways. Um, the first way we rewrote it and made it, made it nicer, and that just didn't look like it was gonna stand the passage of, of time. Um, so we went a different way and, and went with the grain somewhat. And what we did was we decided to put a little BGP daemon within a container, BGP for those of you that aren't familiar, is the protocol that runs the internet. It enables a router to say to another router, hey, I've got these IP addresses, and then between them work out uh, you know, a, the best route to a, to a given prefix. So a container has a BGP daemon, and a host has a BGP daemon. So we can start a container, and it says to its host, hey, I'm here, these are my network requirements. These are the IP addresses I'm, I'm serving. So as a result of that, our containers became what we wanted them to become. They became first-class citizens on the, on the network in exactly the same way as they had um, in the old uh, VM world and bare metal world. So if you trace to one of our services now, um, the last two hops are actually the host. So the penultimate hop is the virtual router within the host. The final hop is the actual container. Every container is, is, is publicly accessible on a, on a uh, public IP address. No need for that, no, no other shenanigans. But what we also did with that was we leveraged um, a protocol called FlowSpec. Now, FlowSpec enables you to carry firewall rules in BGP. So within our container config now, as well as specifying what the network requirements are in terms of IP addressing and things, we can also specify what we want the firewall rules to be. And those firewall rules are announced with the IP addresses to the host and in turn to the network. So we can spin this container up anywhere on the network and it gets the right IP address and it gets the right ac access rights through um, the, edge of, the edge of the network. It's beautiful and it works really, really well for us. If you want to know more on that, um, look at my talk last year, which in particular was about Anycast and how it enables us to do Anycast, specifically having the same IP address in multiple different places on the, on the network and all the benefits that, that delivers. Now, Anycast is kind of big and sexy and aren't we clever and the marketing people are going to strap it over everything that we, we put out for the next six months. But actually, in our experience, the benefits of Anycast are most significant the closer to the core of your operations you get. Um, so for us, take Redis as an example. Reading Redis is one IP address across the network, despite us having dozens and dozens and dozens of instances of Redis. It's anycasted. So if you have a service such as Kama Elio running on a host that needs to read Redis, it will be reading it will be querying the same IP address regardless where on the network it is. And the way Anycast works is that traffic is routed to the closest instance of that IP address. So within a host, you're going to hit the instance that's on the same host. Because remember, your host is acting as a, as a little router. You've got a mini network within, within the host. So traffic isn't even leaving the, the host in this scenario for our Kama Elio container to have service from our Redis container. But the other great thing is in the event of that dying, or been upgraded, or been taken away in some other way, Anycast works just as it did before. It reconnects to the closest instance of that IP address, which happens to be the host next door. So it works really, really well. We've got Anycast. We're only just introducing it in beta on the edge from a SIP perspective, but internally, pretty much every service has Anycast in there at some at some level. And most services have three or four different tiers 
of any cast um, within them, and it's it's been been huge for us. But that's only been enabled by the changes that we made in terms of network, rather than just accepting the the defaults. The other choice you're going to have to make is what you're going to do about storage. Now, coming from the world of VMs, we are used to and we expect to have to have shared storage within a given cluster, so you can migrate VMs between between hosts. Now. I'm the guy that's lost seven sands in six years for every reason imaginable, from natural disasters through to bugs that nobody else on the planet has been able to, able to replicate. I need no persuasion to not have shared storage. Now, there's ways you can do it within a containerized environment, but to be honest, they feel a little bit dirty to me. And like I say, I didn't need much persuasion not to have it. Thankfully, many of the services we use nowadays are clustered or at least replicated. So we've already got the data in multiple different places. So we don't need to worry about shared storage within a site because we're already distributing it far, far wider than a, than a single site. The other decision you're going to have, what we're going to do about service discovery well, there's a few, there's a few options here. I mean, console, ECD, zookeeper, lots of research for your guy that wants to deploy just deploy a, a container. Um, and, and this has a place because in a containerized world, you're going to have lots and lots of instances of the, of the, same, the same service. They need to coexist. They need to, they need to work um, together. We started off with console um, as a, a vehicle for autopilot, as you'll see um, a little bit later on. We actually moved away from it um, altogether, but that's not console's fault, as I'll explain in a, in a little bit. Um, when we moved away from it, we did so because we, we essentially broke it when we wrote the new network stack. So we replaced it with a solution that we affectionately call Gaylord. Now, Gaylord does all of the uh, service discovery, uh, sorry, all of the key value um, sharing that we would have previously had from, from console, but it actually does quite a bit more. It does internal monitoring and it, it facilitates this, this autopilot thing for us essentially. But don't get me wrong, you don't need Gaylord to do, um, to do the autopilot pattern, as I'll show in a, in a second. And the final one, the, the big one really, what orchestration platform are you going to use? Because we're all going to have gazillions of these containers. We're all going to be Google next week. Um, you know, so your very first project, you have to plan for this. <sighs> you don't. Um, the reality is, you know, we all want to scale. We all want dynamic, um, you know, dynamic scaling, but not at the kind of scale that people seem to seem to assume. And I don't believe that that is a problem that we need to solve immediately. But that's not to say that the problems that orchestration solve aren't problems that we want to solve in another way. There are those that say they'll go with whatever the cloud says, because the cloud must be right. And they'll go with you know, Kubernetes if they're on Google Cloud, or they'll go with whatever Amazon's solution is. There's a couple of problems with that. The first one is they may not be the right solution for the application. Um, but the second one is, what about when a different cloud provider is called? Or what about when you want to go bare metal? You're locking yourself into somebody else's decision and somebody else's ecosystem um, working in that way. But the bigger issue for me was the very promise of containerization when we first look at it, looked at it, which was that you could get away from the days of code running on your laptop but not running in production. You know, the very, the very website says, if it runs on your laptop, it will run in production. It will run anywhere. That's not the case if you're locking yourself into some big orchestration platform that you're not going to replicate in your local development environment. You're denying yourself the very promise of containerization by, by some of this stuff. And that didn't seem acceptable to, um, to us. Not to mention, to be honest, we didn't understand a lot of it. You know, the very first day of trying to just trying to get a container up and running and discover what these things are about, to be burdened with all of these decisions and uh, knowledge that is so completely new to you was a, was a challenge. So we decided to leave that for, for another day. And part of the reason for that was the discovery of the autopilot pattern. Now, I think containers should fly themselves. I want to be able to deploy a container um, on a host, and it discover what it's there for. So let's take Redis, for example. 
you could have an image for a Redis master and you could have an image for a Redis slave. Or, as we do, you could just have an image for Redis. And you deploy it and it can interrogate the state of the application or the state of the network and discover what it's there for. So discover whether it needs to be a master, whether it needs to be a slave. But things aren't static. Other services are going to come and go. So this container needs to be able to continue to monitor the environment around it and continue to reconfigure itself for, for what, is, what is going on. Now, you could have an external orchestration service pushing these changes from outside for you. Or, as the autopilot philosophy suggests, you could have your container do it yourself, do it itself. And I think that's a far cleaner, more efficient way of doing it that actually lends itself to, to more efficient orchestration if and when you eventually get the bigger solution in place. We don't want containers needing some jock to SSH in and change things on the, on the fly. That world has, has gone. You know, one of the promises of containerization is that everything is committed, and the version that is running uh, in production is the same as the version that went through testing. Nobody is changing anything live. No containers have, have SSH capability. Um, but also, you don't want to be, you don't have to bootstrap the, the launch of them. You just want to throw them up there and then discover what's going on, fly themselves. And you don't want to rely on any external orchestration platform to do that. And the autopilot patterns, what enabled us to do that? Now, I'm not going to give you a list of the 10 things you must do to be autopilot certified. It's a philosophy. It's not a list of rules. And the philosophy is really what I've articulated on the, the previous slides. How you implement it is entirely up to you, your business, and your, new, your unique um, requirements. But there's a website there um, by the guys who actually came up with this. It's not my philosophy. I haven't invented this. Um, the guys behind the autopilot pattern are the guys at Joyent, um, who we probably all know is a big cloud operator, but also the guys that um, sponsored the Node.js uh, project back in the day. So very capable, technically smart um, bunch of people. And that website has a number of resources on there as to how you could implement this stuff and some, and some use cases. Our approach, and, and much of this talk I blogged about some, some time ago and is available there. Um, I promised you some um, examples. So we deploy a container and how you do this is, is, is up to you. You could use Ansible. Um, you, could do it, you could do it manually. We use a combination of, of both. Our deployment is dramatically simplified by the fact that within the whole network, we essentially have two configurations of hosts, one which is a generic compute node, one which is a voice compute node. The voice compute node's been the only one that handles media, therefore just abstracting media from, from compute. Um, but any container is on every host. So that greatly simplifies our need for a solution that is managing what goes where. And really scale for us is more about adding more hosts. It's not really about dynamically bursting and shrinking to get the best economics of, of cloud. The hosts are sitting there in, in our environment. But equally, you could use this in a cloud environment where you're provisioning new instances through, through Ansible and pushing containers um, to them. When we push a container, there's uh, certain values that need to change for each, for example, for each availability zone. And that's really easy to do in a version controlled, controlled way with templates that on deployment that get, we, um, values get replaced uh, suitable for the, for the environment. And then this container, let's, let's take the example of a Redis. So we deploy this, this Redis instance to, to a host. It starts up. So at this point, we've got an empty container that's running Redis. Doesn't have any services connecting to it because Working this way, rather than working your traditional orchestrated uh, way, our container hasn't announced its availability to the network yet. If we'd used another service just to deploy a, deploy a database server, it, it's highly likely it would have started receiving requests the moment it had started, started life. But because we're in control of the network stack, this container hasn't yet said to the network that it is available. And because of any cast, not having said it's available, it's not receiving any requests. 
So that's great. That gives us time for things to sort themselves out. We've got an empty database sitting there that can look around the network and say, is there a master anywhere? Yes, there's a master. Therefore, I must be a slave. If there isn't a master and a few other safeguards uh, get, get checked, it can become the master. We use Redis a lot. Um, we have very high transaction rate with Redis. We have lots of, lots of nodes, and we store quite a lot of data in there. So the last thing we want is a couple of dozen of these, these new containers coming up, all connecting to the master, asking for a 30 gig database each, and trying to pull that across the wire to various different sites. So any node that is configured as a master is automatically backing itself up to, to off-site storage every, every couple of minutes. What that means is when we spin up a node and it's in this kind of offline state having determined what its, what its role is, it can go off site and it can download that latest data set without putting any load on, on the master. And it can install it. At that point, it's almost ready for service. But what it still needs to do is connect to the master and catch up those last few transactions that have happened in the few minutes since the, since, since the backup. But having done so, it can now announce its IP address and it can now start receiving requests from the network through the, the wonders of Anycast. But it can also say to Gaylord that hey, I'm here, this is the service that I'm offering, um, and Gaylord can act appropriately um, as a result. Now, one of the things that we get out of Gaylord is there's dependency health checks that enable one container to interrogate the status of another. So let's move away from Redis in terms of examples, and let's, let's look, at, look at free switch. So we have an endpoint that a given Kama Elio container would query, for example, and it would get a response something like that. And that is essentially a list of free switches in a given site. Now, because this is all over HTTP or other HTTPS, we're not constrained to doing this within one site. We can actually do this globally. So we can have our, our Kama Elios in London aware of the state of the network in, in you know, say, Seattle. That gives us something that we can not only consume, but something that we can monitor. So we write out a dispatcher config based on initially querying it and we monitor it for changes. And if it changes, we simply exec execute a script within the container. Now that script can be anything you want. It could be a, you know, a binary executable, it could simply be a bash script. Um, in, our, in our case, um, it's a little script that takes some values relevant to the availability zone that, it, that it's in, that take the list of free switches that are there and write out dispatcher.conf and instruct Kama Elio to um, cam control reload. So what that means is we can add new free switch containers. We can spin them up anywhere on the network. Autopilot means they come up, check they're ready for service, announce their availability. Kama Elio knows they're there, updates dispatcher.conf, brings them into service. And exactly the opposite happens going the other way around. And this is without any external orchestration platform managing it. And like I say, it's at global scale with intersite um, into site dependencies where we want them. And Kama Elio is a great example where you might want to dispatch against your local free switches, but you might want a second set of remote free switches, lest the first ones aren't there for whatever reason. So I talked about Redis. Um, I talked about Kama Elio and, and free switch. The, the third category example is, I guess, the one that everybody would use for needing this, this big orchestration. And that is your web services, your Nginx, and that side of things. Now, it's fair to say, if you're in that world, then a lot of the problems that we saw with the traditional approach aren't really there, because frankly, that's, that's the use case that it was written for, and that isn't an issue if you're offering a, um, if you're looking at APIs, and if you've got Nginx sitting there as a load balance, it doesn't matter if you've got a dozen um, a dozen containers behind it on RFC 19, 18 addresses. It just sort of, just sort of works. But the same autopilot philosophy can be applied here, and we do we do exactly that. So our APIs, um, our portal, and various other services that, that drive the network are all behind any casted Nginx instances, 
and those Nginx instances really act as little application routers and themselves consume any casted um, application servers uh, behind them. But all of those are individually using this, this same technique of monitoring the status of other, of other services. So if you want to get started with, with this, um, where we got started and the best way to go as advocates on the autopilot site is console as a key value store. And one of Joint's outputs is containerpilot.js. Containerpilot.js being a great little wrapper that you can run in your container that effectively is a first process that wraps whatever you want that container to be. And that exposes all of this on-change type, uh, type goodness um, to you. And the basic, the, the basic technique is you would, store, you would store expiring values within console, take a database, for example. Hey, I'm the master, and that's set as a key that would live for, say, 10 seconds. So it would, either the running master would update that key and ensure that it always persists, or another container would see that it isn't there and that it needs to become, become the master. But some great, some great resources there that can get you started. Like I say, you may want to go your own way. You might find that this doesn't work in your environment but it will get you started. Um, in terms of what we need to do, um, we need to move more inside the container. You get two devs, you'll get three different opinions, and we've got one that wants more inside, one that wants more outside. I think on balance, um, we need to make the containers slightly, slightly less minimal. Um, I want a little API around, or more of an API around every container. So every container can simply query other containers more directly without necessarily needing this central, this central piece to, to pull that together. Uh, and finally, we want, a, want an orchestration platform, but we'll be choosing one, having the luxury of being in production with containers, them working, and us actually knowing what, what our requirements are, because this enabled us to, to push it back to another time. And that's me. I don't know if we've got time for questions of which Harris, but... Uh, are there any? There's one at the back. There's one at the back there, Abby. Up there. Um, what were the things you found uh, lacking in console that pushed you to develop your own replacement? We broke it. Um, basically, so it worked. It worked perfectly. Um, it's a clustered key value store. And essentially, when we started uh, fannying about with the network stack, it stopped working. Uh, and it was quicker for us to re rewrite something simpler and suitable to our use case than it was to fix it for our use case. But for vanilla use cases, it's perfect. It's one of So can you comment on the performance of the networking stack when running in a container, specifically when running something like FreeSwitch, uh, you know, you're dealing with a jitter buffer, you're dealing with uh, latency. How does that compare to running on a VM and bare metal? So you, you're closer to bare metal with a container than you would be with a VM. So redeploying the same hardware, you're already ahead. But there's a lot of overhead in things like that user land proxy. Uh, but you already have that in a in a VM world. You know, I think back to some of the presentation I did many years ago on a SIP intrusion detection system that we we did, where you got a virtualized Camellio um, sniffing traffic on the network, so it's receiving a lot of traffic that isn't actually SIP, and it's sorting out what the SIP is, and that would run with like 90% CPU just because of the network overhead, for, you know, on, on the uh, the hypervisor. Um, so you're already ahead with containers versus versus VMs, but your you're still behind bare metal because of this stuff that's forced into into user land, and that that's generally okay. That's not that's not a problem because we're generally coming from a from a virtualized world now. But a purist that wants to maximize things might still look to put stuff in on bare metal. So an example uh, on our network is FreeSwitch is containerized. Camellio is containerized. In fact, everything is containerized. 
with one exception, and that one exception is RTP Engine, um, which works perfectly well containerized, um, but it just feels wrong to have that level of, uh, you know, that rate of packets going through the user land proxy. It hasn't presented a problem. It just feels a bit dirty for what's essentially a single binary that we can just install on the on the host. Um, the other thing is that to take RTP Engine as an example, certain kernel modules that you want to access, to get those in the container, you'd need to run them in privilege mode. You'd also need to be modifying the host. So we now have essentially hybrid hosts where it's Debian on the base, RTP Engine, and then Docker sitting alongside with all of our containers on top which means all of our network piece can still work on that host, but we can still have RTP Engine on bare metal. I've got one. Are we all right for time, Travis? Yeah, I've got one at the front here. Are these Any particular issues pertaining to port forwarding when it comes to Docker? No, because we rewrote it. So because a container is announcing its IP address to the host and is a um, first class citizen on the network, it receives all, all ports, all traffic to all ports, subject to the restrictions that we've also announced to the network in terms of, terms of firewall. So that was, that was a real red line for us. We didn't want any of this uh, you know, dynamic IP tables rule nonsense that you, um, you get by default. You know, we want 60 odd thousand RTP ports on a given container. We can have it now. They run, uh, no, they run on the, they use the bridge purely for the purposes of BGP. So you see them as a first class citizen on the network. So some of them use the host network where they don't need a public eye. IP address for incoming stuff. If they're just querying externally, they can just use the host in the, in the normal way. All right, we'll take one more, one more question. Roll yeah. the dice here. Another, got another one in the middle here. Can you do BGP things like prepend paths and take a host out? Yeah, absolutely. So we use, we, we started off with Quagga, which is like a big, juggernaut of a BGP library. We moved to GoBGP, which is like super lightweight and awesome. Um, GoBGP can run in two modes. Uh, the first mode is it can run as a daemon like Quagga. The second mode is it can run as a library for your application. But in both modes, you've got the full feature set of BGP um, available. So yeah, you can prepend, you can also play about with weights and, and various other things, which gets quite interesting with any casted services and load and, and, and things like that. You can do some pretty cool stuff with it. I All right, that, that was, was a wonderful talk. Let's give a big warm round of applause Thank for Simon. Thank you.